Hello Internet and uh, welcome to a video I have chosen to call Sage is really busy at work and hadn't actually had the time to do a proper script or for a proper video this week. Also, this might actually be a day late. If so, well, it's still the work thing that basically kept me going. Anyway, I still needed to do something because I need to keep myself busy and I like making these. So, what to do, what to do, what to do? Well, we go directly to the source and the source in my case is Vikings. And again, since I didn't have time to do a proper sort of script, I decided that the way to do it was to give a bunch of Viking trivia. Not so much Viking information like I've done before, but more like actual, like smaller stories, smaller tidbits of information that perhaps haven't gotten in earlier videos or doesn't exactly deserve a full video of its own. So yeah, I hope you'll enjoy it. So how far did the Viking culture or Viking sort of uh, influence stretch? Well, uh, basically the picture you see here is a fairly good indicator of that. Yes, it is fairly certain nowadays that Vikings from Iceland and um, Greenland eventually made it over to um, North America, but if so, it was pinprick settlements soon gone. At the same time, yes, there were Vikings in Greenland but for almost 200 years, but again, they were pinprick settlements uh, that didn't really leave any real sort of legacy apart from bringing Greenland into the uh, sort of cultural circle of Scandinavia. The core lands of Viking culture is obviously what you see in dark red or dark brown. Denmark, Sweden, uh, Norway some areas of the northern German coasts, but the Rus state, the early Russian state that Russia have taken the name from, was also Vikings, presumably either from Frisia or from Sweden. So in that way, they reached all the way down uh, to the Black Sea and in contact with Constantinople. Iceland, of course, was settled by Vikings from Norway, as well as the islands of the northern um, Atlantic Ocean, uh, parts of Scotland, parts of Ireland were also settled by Vikings who influenced the local culture. In fact, several Irish and Scottish ancient noble families are basically bringing their lines back to Viking raiders who settled there. Most of Northumbria, which is, of course, the north uh, east of modern-day England, was basically a Viking or at least a northern sort of culture and realm for several hundred years and naturally um what's it called the uh norman lands in in france was descendant of vikings though they actually fairly quickly christianized and and became part of the french culture more than the viking ones the green territories are like other indigenous people where vikings had uh, influence and yes, they did in fact plunder all the way down across Spain and into the Mediterranean. But the core lands was, as you saw earlier, those particular areas. But the Vikings were spread out, raiding, pillaging, trading, and just exploring all across those areas. There are in fact Vikings that we know have reached all the way down to sub Saharan Africa, but they were of course very, very rare. How long did the Viking Age last? Well, as we all know, the Viking Age sort of officially began in 17, sorry, 793 with the raid at Lindisfarne and ended in about 1066 with the defeat of the uh, Norwegian invasion of England just before the Battle of Hastings. In practice, however, the Viking eras probably lasted a bit longer. The First sort of recorded Viking raids are already back in the late 6th century, early 7th century in England and northern France. So at least some of the Viking culture and the uh, technology that has to do with its ships and weaponry and so on must have coalesced at that point from the uh, mixture of peoples that would have arrived in Scandinavia during the migration periods in the uh, 4th and early 5th centuries. When did it end? Well, 1066 is actually a really good year for it. That was sort of the last real kind of um, Viking raid that transpired, but 
in practice, the Swedes to a certain degree kept uh, messing around over in Russia. And uh, the last real sort of Danish Viking king, if you want to call him that, was Canute the Saint, uh, who was in the 1080s. And of course, no Norwegians were not sort of really united in putting away the old customs, especially up in the northern parts of the country, until later. So as a general rule, I suppose you could say that the height of the Viking era was 793 to 1020, 1025, 1030. Uh, but overall, it lasted probably from around 680, 650, 680 something until about maybe 1100, 1110. So what weaponry was used by the Vikings? Well, most of them are already known. Of course, you may, you, everyone used a sword to a certain degree, but at the same time, swords were probably mostly reserved either for noblemen or richer warriors or uh, noblemen's uh, private armies, the one called Heerts, their sort of man-at-arms, personal man-at-arms, because swords were expensive, could not really be used for anything, and Viking armies were, for the most part, again, unless some specific nobleman just went out to raid on his own, they were militia armies, called out by whatever nobleman or king held sway, and various um, villages then had to supply troops and ships for the operation, so Armors were, well, armor was for most Vikings uh, probably just the uh, famous round, uh, famous round uh, shield. And if they were lucky, a little bit of uh, padded clothing and then probably a spear or perhaps an axe. For richer Vikings, they might have scraps of uh, metal armor and again, were probably using axes. Yes, war axes was definitely a Viking thing along with the uh, spears. Spears were very popular because one of the primary Viking tactics was doing the run away and then ambush people attack. Many, many, many battles seem to have been won by the Vikings advancing in a strong and uh, powerful formation, then seeming like they're breaking air during the battle, running away, their opponents follow them, break their formation, Vikings quickly regain their formation, turns around and slaughters them. This also seems to have been the course of the Viking sort of weird battle uh, hairdo, where they had long hair in the front of their heads, and but the back of their heads were completely shaved even off. This seemed to have indicated to be indicating that uh, you know people shouldn't have the chance to grab their hair while they were doing the runaway trick. The richer Vikings, of course, then would use either axes depending on their um, uh, interest or swords, and then full chain, or perhaps a bit later some overlocking scale armor, and of course the famous. Uh, Viking helmets, which no, they did not in fact have horns. I have said this before, but I cannot emphasize it enough. Viking helmets did not have horns. However, weaponry would, as I said, be spears, then axes, then swords for the wealthier, and armor would be the shields, the helmets, some padded, uh, some padded kind of clothing, and then if you could afford it, a full ring mail. The Raven Banner. What is the Raven Banner? I have mentioned the Raven Banner several times. The Raven Banner was a mid-Viking era battle flag that was used primarily by Danish Vikings and by Danish Vikings uh, stationed or at least living in England. Uh, it ha was basically sort of like a quarter flag put on a spear or a lance that was uh, put up before a battle and the... Uh, Conceit was that if the wind was high enough to have it sort of flapping around, so it looked like it was flying around, the battle would be won. If it hung down low, well, the battle would be lost. It is definitely attested to several battles, so we know it had existed, though. How much of it is a uh, later embellishment as sort of like something people ca caught on to, and how much it was a thing is not truly knowledgeable. Legends say that it was first uh, sewn for Ragnar Lothbrok by some of his daughters, and again, why I have discussed in earlier videos Ragnar Lothbrok's existence or no, but 
whether or not he actually existed, there does seem to be some indication that might have come from the people that has sort of been attested to be in his family, because it did seem to be particularly used by Danish Vikings during the era of his descendants' time on the throne, like uh, Sigurd Worm in the Eye and even to a certain degree later Gorm the Old, while also being used particularly by uh, Danish Vikings in southern Northumberland, where people like Ivar the Boneless and Bjorn Ironside is seem to have had their strongholds when they weren't out raiding. But as a de- definite rule, the um, Raven Banner, if I ever should refer to that again, was that a sort of battle flag used by some Vikings that were rumored to have a certain degree of... Um, uh, predictory ability since it was hallowed to the ravens of Odin and thus to Odin the war god himself. My favorite historically attested Vikings. Well, there is several. In no particular order, we have Eric the Blood Axe, king of Norway and son of Harold the Hairy. Just because of his name, he was quite active in a, as a Viking in northern in the northern uh, Atlantic Ocean, and he did become king of Norway for a time until he was killed by his um, well, the guy who also felt like he was just the guy to be king of Norway. So you know that sort of thing happens. Um, other than that, I think they would be someone like the leaders of the Yom's Vikings, just for all the stuff they did. Um, someone like, of course, Eric the Red, who had to leave first Norway because he was being declared an outlaw for killing people, going to Iceland, leaving there because he was being declared an outlaw for killing people, and then finally settling on Greenland, and I wouldn't have been surprised if he wasn't so old at that point, he would have had to go to North America that his son developed, you know, after being declared an outlaw for killing people. But this also, of course, shows how Viking culture to a certain degree worked, because Despite being declared an outlaw for killing people, he was perfectly capable of becoming, uh, you know, a uh, honored citizen of other Viking communities, and in fact, in the end, a leader of the Greenland settlements. Other than that, I think it will probably have to be Svein Forkbeard, king of Denmark. Just because of all the Vikings out there, he might have been the most successful one. He reconquered Norway who had broken away from his rule he conquered all of Denmark parts of Sweden most of the northern German coast and he finally actually managed to conquer all of England the only sort of real Viking who managed to conquer all of England not just parts of it and not just raiding it so in my opinion probably the most successful Viking leader of all times Beyond that, ooh, there are a couple that could be mentioned. Some of the uh, Lothbrok sons, Sigurd Worm in the Eye, I have mentioned many times, just because he actually managed to place himself and his dynasty upon the throne of Denmark. In fact, they are still there uh, 1,200 years later. So kudos to you, buddy. Or just Ivor Boneless for what he apparently did. Or, yeah, there are plenty. But I think my favorite Viking leader, if you want to go with like that, have to be Sven Forkbeard, King of Denmark. Even though he was probably, at least towards the end of his life, more Christian than heathen. But then again, he was in the later part of the Viking era. Viking medicine practices. Well, that doesn't seem to be any sort of real indication that Viking medicinal practices were you know any higher than was average at the time they were probably also suffering from the fact that only uh, like priests or wise women were usually used for doctors Uh, most of the time they would have probably done like most natural people and relied on you know tradition and herb law and you know, sweat huts or whatever was available. There are some stories about after battles where wise old women would function as surgeon leaders, basically, walking around. And uh, there's a story about one battle where she walked around the battlefield, this old uh, surgeon woman, and had the wounded eat garlic. After a while, she would smell their stomach wounds because if you could smell the garlic, then they had a perforated, uh, you know, intestines, and she realized she wouldn't be able to save them, so she left them to die and concentrated on those that could be saved. 
One thing Vikings, of course, could do and were very good at, like most warrior people, was that they had fairly decent um, ability to treat, um, well, wounds. Not necessarily diseases or anything, but of course they had great experience in how to deal with cut wounds and stab wounds and whatever else was necessary. And in fact, you very rarely hear of Vikings dying... um, Uh, after battles. Either they died in battles, and if they survived the battles, they usually survived for quite a long time. So obviously they knew how to uh, deal with uh, battle injuries and so on. Uh, Though, of course, dying in battle was considered a positive thing to a certain degree, so there might also have been cases where people have, shall we call it voluntarily, ended up dying in battle rather than anything else. There are certainly stories about, you know, people drinking their own blood in order to fulfill an oath before they die or whatever, whatever, whatever. But under most circumstances, one thing we do know, however, that I almost forgot, is that they were eating a certain root to stave off... uh, We don't know exactly what root it is, but they were eating a certain root to stave off scurvy. Uh, which is, of course, a thing on uh, ship uh, ships, which, of course, the Vikings were doing a lot, long sea, sea journeys. And since they didn't have access to lemons or limes or anything else that was used, of course, in the various navies in pre-modern times, uh, we don't know exactly what they were eating. It might have been something called kvan, which I don't know exactly what it is, but we do know that was something Vikings had control over. So, yeah. Dragon heads on the longship. Yes, there was actually a thing about uh, lowering and keeping them up when you reach shore. Theoretically, you had to lower the uh, dragon's heads in order to not offend the uh, sort of land um, trolls or land giants or land spirits. So as they would, you know, you were treating them with proper respect and so you went ashore, they wouldn't turn against you. But yes, there probably also was something about sailing into a town or anything with the dragon head up was a clear challenge. Not just to the land spirit, but also to the fools who were there in case they were trying to get on with it, uh, with you or something. But yes, the concept of l- uh, lowering or having the dragon head high on the longship when sailing into harborage was actually a thing. My favorite Viking stories. Well, of course, there is the Heimskringla and there is the sagas and everything. But in modern days, if anyone wants to read about Vikings as in people sort of expected Vikings to act, even though it does to a certain degree annoys me by being set at the end of the Viking era where everyone was converting to Christianity, I would have liked to personally see it in a bit earlier days when the Viking culture was strong and really vibrant. But you should read the one in English called The Long ships or red worm it's written by a um some swedish guy but it takes place mostly actually in sort of the danish cultural circle at the time which was after all also the sort of main viking culture in the given time but the long ships or red worm it's really funny it's really well written and it sort of tries to keep a certain I don't know how to put it. It tries to keep a certain kind of uh, mentality uh, of Vikings rather than uh, describing it as we would in modern times. It's really, really good. Also, I mentioned the Raven banner earlier and I managed to find a picture of it. So that is what you see right now. Well, so the Vikings were plundering and pillaging and raiding all over England and France and other European territories. And um, yeah... The question, of course, is why didn't the various kingdoms and empires in those areas go, you know, back and actually try to take some revenge or conquer the Viking areas, or for that matter, just stop them from actually attacking back? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I think I mentioned it in several other videos, but I want to do it again. First of all, those particular kingdoms were not actually all that particular united all the time, especially in England. In uh, France, where the Carolingian Empire was also splintering uh, very much during this particular area, they were very busy fighting Uh, you know, each other and various other enemies, so they couldn't really gather up that huge an army. Uh, Also, of course, the armies of the southern countries was really, really powerful, but they were also, to a certain degree, kind of... They had to be gathered, fed, closed, and paid. 
If they invaded the northern armies, where, uh, the northern lands, where to the best uh, knowledge of everyone who lived in the south, everyone there was basically crazy Vikings, there would probably be potential for quite a bit of collateral damage to the, your own army. Also, while several attacks were actually made against the um, uh, Scandinavian Peninsula, primarily, of, of course, up the Jutland Peninsula, they were, to a certain degree, held back by fairly strong defensive positions and, more importantly, the complete control the Vikings had over the sea with their massive uh, shipborne technology. The southern uh, forces might ravage the Jutland Peninsula if they would, but they wouldn't really have anywhere to go after that, and the Vikings would have been able to we just hold them onto land because they controlled the seas. Their shipborne technology was way too superior superior to anything the Franks or the British had, in which case they would gather up forces from Sweden, from Norway, and from the Danish heartlands in Scania and Sealand, because, of course, they wouldn't particularly like being invaded from the south, even if they didn't like the people who were being invaded, gather a massive fleet, and then raid back. So, yeah, that's probably the reason why the southern countries didn't try Charles the Great Charlemagne did have a couple of ideas about how to do it, but he also failed. So yeah, that's the reason. Another thing that's worth noticing is the Varangian Guard. This was a guard that was created in Constantinople for the Byzantine emperors after one of them had married a princess of Kiev, or more specifically from the Russian leaders of Kiev. And they, who were after all still at that point during the Viking culture, then sent a bunch of warriors down there to form an honor guard. And that honor guard proved to be so efficient and important that the rulers of uh, Constantinople just basically kept it up, and basically kept it up until the fall of uh, Kiev as a northern state. They did sort of keep it up afterwards, but after that there weren't that many Vikings in it, also because the age of the Vikings were over. However, this was probably where, you know, the Vikings stretched into the certain degree of the Middle East and got some experiences and shall we call, influences from there. In fact, one of the most famous ones to serve in it was the one often called the last Viking, Harald Hadrade, a Norwegian uh, Viking and nobleman who decided to marry a prin also marry a princess of Kiev and was told by her father that he wasn't famous enough. So he decided to become famous enough and he did that by going to Constantinople, enrolling in the Varangian Guard, becoming a commander there and becoming a very successful and important and rich warrior. He mostly did it by winning a bunch of battles, slaughtering the survivors and cutting the noses and ears of the, his prisoners. But, you know, this was the Viking era. He used what you had to do. After then getting married, he eventually returned to Norway and became king of Norway, or at least king of part of Norway. And it was him that Harold Godwinson uh, defeated in the Battle of Stamford Bridge, but so depleted his army that in uh, 1066 that it was then smashed to bits by William the Conqueror at um, uh, Hastings a few months later. So yeah, Varangian Guard, very important part of the sort of Viking mythology, even if it didn't really have anything to do with independent Vikings per se, since it was a uh, part of the Constantinople or Eastern Roman military. Moving on, I sort of touched on this in previous videos, but I just want to make this clear again. When sagas and so on talks about various kings, and you often get the idea that Scandinavia had like 15 million kings at the time, it has to do with how kingship was defined. Theoretically, anyone who ruled anything under their own power instead of, of being vassals to someone else could call themselves kings but even in the latter years of the viking era someone even if there was like a king who held all of denmark all of norway and all of sweden you could still call yourself a sea king or call yourself a king while you were at sea which was basically like the supreme leader of any raiding viking fleet so that's basically the reason, in my opinion, why someone like Ragnar Lothbrok was described as a king. I very much doubt he actually was, but he probably was a king in that particular sense. He was a sea king, uh, 
you know, the leader of his particular raiding parties. Some might indicate that's also why his uh, son Sigurd Worm in the Eye was a king, but I, uh, as you know by now, hold to the idea that he probably, in the chaos after the death of the younger Harik II, uh, eventually returned and claimed kingship, actual kingship, over, if not all of Denmark, then at least the eastern parts, the old core lands of Sealand and Scania. So there is a difference between king and sea king, and that is the reason why the concept of king during Viking era must also be taken with a sort of grain of salt unless you happen to have someone who is undisputably king on land and not just some raiding leader. If you want to go be Viking tourist, what should you see? Well, there are several things you should see. If you happen to be in England, there are many places, particular in the old Northumbria area in the northeast, you can see. But definitely go to York, Jorvik, the old northern capital for most of the, if not actual capital, then at least cultural capital for most of that particular period. Norway and Sweden has their own things, but I'm not super into where what is preserved or not. In Denmark, however, you should go see Jelling, the old capital of Gorm, the old uh, Harold Bluetooth and Sven Forkbeard, where there is a very where there is several rune stones and a large uh, sort of um, uh, collection of shipstones. You should go see the Trelleborgs, which is all sort of round castles that we don't really know what they're used for. They might actually be towns or something, but most people think nowadays that they were a sort of military barracks for the king's armies. They're spread all across the country, though the most famous of them and the most well-preserved is uh, outside Slaelse in, um, in the western part of Sealand. There is also Old Lyra, which used to be sort of the old uh, capital, eastern capital of the Vikings on Sealand. There are Ribe in Jutland, which is basically Denmark's oldest town, which has a very large Viking center, uh, research center and museum. But also the central part of the town is interesting in and of itself and does have possibly some Viking heritage left, even though it is, of course, to a certain degree buried under Christianity. And you should probably go see Roskilde, which also has some nice Viking um, artifacts left here and there. And finally, a note on languages. Vikings, of course, seem to have spoken what we today would call uh, ancient Nordic or old Nordic, which seems to have been sort of a common tongue throughout the Scandinavian peninsula as, and, and Denmark, with, of course, with some local regional dialects and so on, not saying everyone spoke exactly the same language. That would be silly. Of course, in the far northern regions, the same uh, uh, peoples and so on were speaking their own language in here and there. But most people seem to have been speaking some variation of the old Nordic dialects. Now, modern Danish, Sweden and Norwegian has been much influenced by the arrival of French, German, English and a multitude of other uh, tongues until we reach the languages we have today, and I very much doubt any modern uh, Scandinavian would be able to understand even a tiny, tiny bit of what a Viking was trying to tell him. However, there seemed to be some indication that the language currently spoken on the Faroe Islands, and perhaps especially the language spoken in Iceland, seemed to hold quite a bit of kinship to ancient uh, ancient northern that they are sort of languages that hasn't really been influenced by others because of their uh, because they were spoken on these fairly insulated islands and seem to have at least some degree of kinship with how most scholars believed the vikings were speaking so yeah if you want to know what an actual viking sounds like my uh, suggestion would be to find an icelandic dress him up in a beard and an axe and have him shout at you uh, so yeah that's that's that well that was it once more, an example that when the sage decides to make a short little video without any particular inspiration, so he just needs to go back to the well and talk about shit, he absolutely fails in making a short little video where he just goes back. Well, I did go back to the well and talk about shit, but short is perhaps um, 
wrong word to use about a 30 minute video but anyway i hope you enjoyed this next time i think i will actually for the first time in quite a while talk about maybe the american civil war or possibly even go to the napoleonic wars which is after all my speciality so yeah until then i have been the sage and i wish you all a very happy day